So if anybody was here last week, though, some of that reading probably sounds familiar. It bugged me that the lectionary schedule of readings actually took the story and split it in half. When you split a story in half, you get two separate meanings because you really have two separate stories, and I wanted to address this as a whole. I assure you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. That would have been a boom, drop the mic moment and walk away. There's a Methodist minister I found who relays this story of going home. A few months after I finished seminary and entered full-time pastoral ministry, I was invited to preach at my home church. The day arrived and the crowds came. I looked around and I took it all in. There was my first grade teacher, pillar member of our congregation, always seated in the same place, fourth row back, left side from the aisle. There were my neighbors and classmates and people who I, I cut their grass and whose newspapers I delivered. My hometown had come out to greet one of their own. At the risk of sounding boastful, he goes on to say, I had a good sermon too. If it wasn't a home run, it was at least a double or a triple. I remember that feeling of a job well done. I gave the benediction and I joined in the recessional down the main aisle and I got ready to greet everybody at the door and wait for the accolades. However, he goes on to tell us, I soon realized that no one paid any attention to my sermon at all. <laughs> they were more complimentary about how I looked in my robe and how proud they were just to see one of their own up there Rather than any express sense of God having spoken through him, they, he says, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. In today's gospel, we have Jesus, the illegitimate son of a carpenter, who has been gone for a while now, and there have been stories. Now, this isn't a large region, and even without newspapers, word spreads. Then there have been good stories, too. He, he has been preaching. He was baptized. He'd gone on a retreat in the desert. He came back. And everybody was talking about what he was doing throughout the land. And now he was coming home. And there was all sorts of excitement around this. Jesus is coming home. Jesus is going to teach in our synagogue. Imagine the headlines. Hometown boy makes good. Come see the man in action. <laughs> People were geared up for something special. Yet, you know, sometimes the anticipation of the event this is the greatest part. Now I'm going to share another story with you that I found very interesting. There was once an evangelist named Billy Sunday. Now he was around the late 1800s, early 1900s. He was the Billy Graham of the time before there was mass media. He was conducting a crusade in a particular city. And in the sermon, he said something critical of the labor conditions for the workers of that city. After the service, several businessmen sent him a message which read, Billy? Leave the labor matters alone and concentrate on getting people saved. Stay away from political issues. You're rubbing the fur the wrong way. And Billy Sunday sent this message back to them. If I'm rubbing the fur the wrong way, tell the cats to turn around. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, Jesus was about to stroke the fur the wrong way. Now, don't get me wrong. At first, all was good. He stood up and he read from the scroll like he was supposed to. He read from Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, and to liberate the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Also translated as the year of the Jubilee. I actually looked this up and every seventh year you're supposed to let your fields rest. And after seven times seven years, the year following is the year of Jubilee where debts are forgiven, slaves are freed, the land is resting, and there's a great celebration. Supposedly. I can't find anything that says it actually happened, but this is what they were hearing, and this is their tradition, and they believe this was about to happen. I doubt that it happened in a Roman-occupied Jerusalem. So he hands the scroll back to the caretaker and sits down. Now, to you, this and I, this may seem a little odd, but it's actually the norm. The teacher sits to teach. The students are below him on the ground, probably. And everybody else is pushing against him, trying to hear from behind. It's much like the story of Jesus at the temple. He was seated with the teachers. So Jesus took a seat, nothing new there, and everyone is paying really close attention. They've all heard the stories, already circling about his skills as a teacher. And he says, the scripture has now been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, let me stop right here for a minute and say there is something about the word of the prophet being fulfilled, but not because it is written. 
It is only fulfilled in the hearing. There is something physical and contextual about the word when it is read out loud. I mean, our service would not be the same if we said, here's today's reading, now sit quietly among yourselves, and then I will tell you what I think it means. It doesn't work that way. There is a physical need for the scripture to be heard and read. I may read it one way, Tom may read it another, and each one of you hears what you need to hear. You, some of you contextualize it one way, some contextualize it the other, some are more open, I can't wait to hear what this means for me. Others say, oh, that's what I heard, this is what it is, and that's the way it's gonna be. Everybody hears the word their own way. And then I do my best to speak and give spirit to that word so that it moves you in a way that you already have contextualized it, or maybe beyond where you contextualized it. I hope I have a little bit of talent there. I don't know. <laughs> so the crowd was already geared up. And then Jesus reads the scripture and announces it is fulfilled through the people's hearing of the word. And the crowd is happy. The gospel says they are happy. They like what they have heard. The Bible says they were amazed. Anybody here amazed yet? Okay. I'm afraid I don't have that power, but... Of course, they were all the more amazed because isn't this Joseph's boy? Isn't this that kind of illegitimate, scandalous birth thing that happened a few years ago? Wasn't he supposed to be a carpenter? Well, I can see them all just nodding in agreement and murmuring how amazing this guy is, just like everyone said. Now, that Methodist minister I told you about, he goes on to talk about this would be a good point to quit while you're ahead. <laughs> and you know that saying, you should always leave them wanting more. If Jesus wanted to quit while he was ahead, now is a great time for the benediction, at least if he's trying to win friends and influence people. Yet Jesus' sermon isn't finished yet. No, as one may say, he couldn't just stop there and leave well enough alone. He had to keep on going. And Jesus basically says, you're not going to like what I'm about to say. So he's already set himself up for failure. You're going to ask me to do tricks and miracles for you, but I'm not going to do that here. Instead, I'm going to remind you of two other scripture stories. This is what he's telling them about. He's relating two other scripture stories. He goes on to speak about the time in Elijah when there was great famine and the people of Israel were hurting. But God did not send the prophet to Israel. He sent him to a widow in Sidon, a Gentile, to care for the prophet. Then he recounts the story of Naaman, a commander of Syria's army, and believed to be an enemy, and yet Elijah, Elisha, sorry, cured him of his leprosy as opposed to curing an Israelite or a Jew from the same suffering. So why did Jesus' gentle reminder of a scripture they already know upset them so much? Jesus wasn't relaying anything new. Jesus wasn't saying anything more than just relating their own story back to them. But something in hearing these stories caused something to shift in the whole crowd. Yes, they knew these stories. Yes, this is our own story, they say, but God is blessing fraternizing with Gentiles in these stories. You're supposed to be one of us. You came here for us. How dare you? You see, what is getting to the people here is Jesus is saying, my ministry is not just for you. God has been here for you and always will be, but now is the time of the outsider. Now is the time of the other, the exile and the despised. From the Gospels, this means now is the time of the tax collector, the Samaritan, the woman at the well. This is the time of the leper, the lame, the blind, and the deaf. The people of Israel have had God's prophets, the teachers, and the words for all these years. And they tell the stories of the great miracles and redemptions of the people. God gave them the law the land and salvation. Now it's time to go further. This is what made them angry. This is what made Jesus' own people try to run him out of town and throw him off a cliff. But instead of arguing or fighting, Jesus just turned and walked away, leaving them to replay this whole scenario in their minds over and over again. And you know they did. I mean, you ever hear something you don't like or something that upset you? You go to talk about it with somebody else. You go to recount it with somebody else. You sit at home and you mull it over your head. You're not going to forget that moment for a while. You know, sometimes 
I'm not going to name names, but a day doesn't go by in this day and age where you don't hear something disparaging about somebody or you hear something some politician says that just makes you very angry. And I have confessed, I have engaged in the same reactions. As a person of extremely liberal brand, <laughs> I'm usually just as disparaging of someone as somebody else's. And so at this point, I'm going to get on my little soapbox for a minute to remind myself we have to pray for those we disagree with. For some people, the world is changing so fast around them, they are clinging on to the very last bit of the world that they know and understand. This world will not exist in 10 to 20 years. America is changing in how we look at the other and who we believe should be treated with human kindness and love as opposed to having lines drawn and being declared unworthy. <coughs> now step off. You see, that's what Jesus is doing here. The lines that Israel had drawn around religious beliefs and laws and restrictions, who they decided was in and out and how they practiced those beliefs, Jesus was saying it's done. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Every time a bell wings, an angel gets its wings. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus is saying, we'll have no more of this. Now is a time of loving and welcoming and accepting. A loving and welcoming and accepting God. And that will be Jesus' challenge to the established hierarchy and the norms of the time. And it remains and still challenges us here this very day. Jesus challenges the United Church of Christ, and we challenge ourselves to be a loving and open community, but we still have a long way to go. You know, I'm talking denomination-wide, but I wonder how many of our congregations have engaged in Just Peace Movement, or even heard of it. The Just Peace Movement focuses attention on alleviating systematic injustice of all types using nonviolence, and calls us to offer a message grounded in the hope and re of reconciliation in Jesus that peace is possible. And of course here, we are, quote, now an open and affirming church, because <laughs> we've joined the UCC, you know, originally designed to serve the gay community, but our doors and our walls are broader than that. But in the, in the United Church of Christ, you know we have 14 seminaries, and only eight of them proclaim to be open and affirming. Of the 5,000 churches in the United Church of Christ, only roughly about 1,300 are open and affirming. We still have a long way to go. And even those that proclaim their own name often do not want to discuss what further may mean. They think making a proclamation and putting a sign or a flag outside the wall is enough. But we're called to do more than that. And I wonder how many of our churches are accessible to all or even know about the United Churches of Christ Disabilities Ministries. People believe being accessible means putting in a ramp or widening a doorway or putting in an extra large bathroom and then calling it a day. It's interesting, I'm going to quote to you from the United Church of Christ Disabilities Ministries proclamation because it actually goes beyond physical and mental disabilities. To be a church where everyone is welcome. To encourage local churches to be open, inclusive, affirming, accessible in all aspects of their lives, including buildings, worship, education, fellowship and service, and thereby enable to proclaim God's word with and to all persons, including people with disabilities. And I'm going to add this, all disabilities are not visible. And that is sometimes something we tend to forget. We are called to advocate with and for persons with disabilities, especially people who have been marginalized and alienated. What does that mean? Where are we called to go? Who should we be partnering with? to advocate for and collaborate with caregiving ministries and for persons with disabilities, to develop and support the leadership of laity and clergy with disabilities, which we rarely see at all levels within the United, entire United Church of Christ, to encourage all settings of the United Church of Christ to consciously use language that's inclusive and sensitive to accessibility and disability issues, and to offer maybe forums and, of communication and networking. We have local projects, food pantries, hospitals, Habitat for Humanity that call our attention every day. We have the homeless on our very own streets and we have the mentally ill who do not receive services simply because they do not have a permanent address. We still have workplace inequality, 
We have wage theft, and we have forms of enslavement that are happening right here in the city of Los Angeles right now. Now, I must say, I applaud the city. Of all, all our homeless shelters today, starting last night, are open 24 hours because of the rain. Then my question goes to why aren't they open 24 hours every day? Now what happens in your heads and in your hearts, I want to know, when you hear such a litany of so many things? What happens when you hear all about them? This isn't about us. Do you hear what I just said? This is about them. Jesus said this is all about them. That's what upset people of Nazareth. They thought that God's saving grace was going to be all about them, not all about them. And here's a little secret that most people don't realize. But you see, Sunday is all about us. <laughs> Yet today, here and now, this is about us. It's about us resting in God's spirit. It's about us being grateful for God's gifts. It is about us getting energized and inspired and refueled. But for what? Refueled with God's loving spirit so we can go out and serve them. So we can become the kingdom of God here on earth, here and now, and welcome all into our midst with love and compassion and understanding. If you have a question about something, ask. If you want to know what we can do, let's seek it out together. We have a feeding program that is wonderful here. You can participate in that. And there are other programs that many churches work on that we can always partner with. Maybe we need to start brainstorming about that. So, In conclusion, I want to share a poem by Simone Portman that she shared at the World Conference of Churches, World Council of Churches. It's titled, Them and Us. Them. Us. Where do I fit in? If I'm one of them, they are us. If I'm one of us, who are they? Being one of us is only half. I miss them. Only when I am one of them can I be a part of the complete us. And I know both them and us. How do I dare to become one of them in order to become of us? She was a delegate from the Netherlands. Let us pray. Loving God, in our brokenness and our search to find wholeness for ourselves, let us also seek to find wholeness for our community and the world. Help us to see in the other and welcome them with love, compassion, and understanding that only through your grace we may provide. Help us and bless us as we strive to bring your kingdom here and now. Amen. <laughs>